today we have Uta Erdburger. Uh, she's from University of Virginia um, in USA. Uh, Uta is a physician scientist. Uh, she's interested in translational research to study EVs as novel biomarkers and bioactivators in kidney disease and hypertension. After receiving her medical degree at the Free University of Berlin in Germany, she received training as a nephrologist at the University of North Carolina. And she is currently an associate professor of medicine at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, USA. Uh, she's also uh, very well known in the society. She's the treasurer for the International Society for Accessible Physicals. So today um, she's going to share um, her talk, uh, which is uh, EVs modulate vascular function and more in hypertension. Welcome, Uta. Okay, good. <laughs> I um, like to thank Carolina and Dolor Dolores for organizing this great web EV series. I'm, I'm very happy and honored to participate here. And hello to all the EV enthusiasts right now who have joined. So thank you very much. I'm a nephrologist, kidney doctor, as you learned, and take care of patients with hypertension, which is a topic for today. In particular, I will talk about EVs as novel biomarkers and bioactivators. Let's see if I can advance. <laughs> oh, down here. Okay, I don't have a conflict of interest. This is the outline. I will try to convince you that we should test uh, and study EVs in hypertension, essential uh, hypertension. Then I have um, a few comments on EVs, biogenesis, diversity, and the different roles they might play in hypertension. And I will also provide some methodological consideration, what we do in my lab, and because I show some data from our lab, um, so to, to understand which models we use. And then I will give you a couple of examples of the diverse roles of EVs and hypertension, and focus a little bit more on the vascular function, and then wrap everything up, and I'm open to your questions. So let's start with the question, why should we study EVs in hypertension? So over 100 million people have um, hypertension in the US, according to the latest American Heart Blood Pressure Guidelines, which came out in 2017. But, but globally, about um, three and a half billion adults have not optimally controlled systolic blood pressure. And hypertension is also a major modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease and kidney disease. Um, but by treating hypertension, we can really save uh, many lives. So for example, if you reduce the blood pressure by about five milliliter of mercury, um, you would reduce the uh, mortality rate by stroke by 14% and the cardiovascular mortality by 9%. So we can really accomplish here something. The etiology is multifactorial. So there exists a lot of knowledge gaps for the mechanism in, in hypertension. In over 96%, we don't have a clear cause for arterial hypertension. That's why we call it essential or primary. And then there is a big debate, actually, and this is ongoing for the last four decades and we're getting more evidence, but what is really uh, the best blood pressure goal? You know, um, when shall we start treating people with uh, elevated hypertension and what's the best way to measure blood pressure and when? So many unanswered questions. We are, we're getting better to answer those, but we still need novel uh, tools to investigate hypertension. So for over a century, actually, we are using the indirect Riberacci and Korotkov method, which uh, is using this blood pressure curve. And hyper blood pressure is defined by the manometric unit of millimeter of mercury. So there is need for novel non-invasive tools to identify, in particular, uh, the pathophysiological mechanisms in hypertension, because we still don't understand um, all the mechanism. We also want to identify early on end organ damage. Hypertension is a silent disease. So when do we need to treat? And ideally find also tools to guide the hypertensive treatment. As you know, all drugs have their side effects. So I know I'm a little EV centric, EV biased, but EVs are possible new candidate biomarkers and bioactivators, and I call them also hidden messengers. 
So um, I know that I'm talking to EV experts here and I will not dig deeper here into the biogenesis of EVs. But I like to uh, point out that, as you know, we are dealing with a very heterogeneous group of vesicles, heterogeneous in size, density, cargo content, and depending on which stimulus there is, uh, in vivo, in vitro, we have and generate different types of EVs, larger ones through a blebbing process or releasing EVs from the multivesicular bodies and then having different cargos. Um, I mentioned this because I will show you data later where, which illustrates you know, that different stimuli lead to different cargo and different functional effects. So they, I told you the EVs are diverse, but the etiology of hypertension is also multifactorial. Many hypertension phenotypes exist and um, many systems are involved and uh, the nervous system, um, the kidney, um, the vas vessels, the immune system, and there are also many vasoactive hormones. And you can imagine that each of these systems is releasing and uh, providing the stimulus for different types of EVs. And you can also imagine that in the end, it's almost like directing an orchestra to control blood pressure. Sorry, I have to push at the bottom. So in my lab, we focus on the role of the kidney and vessel as a kidney doctor. Um, and you re might remember from your physiology classes that blood pressure is defined at vascular resistance times cardiac output. And in particular, the small resistance arteries are really the important players for blood pressure control and regional distribution of the blood flow. And long-term wise, if there's high blood pressure, it comes to a change also of the vessel wall. And there are different parts of the vessels which can be affected, not just the endothelium, but also the adventitia and the vascular media, intima, and different things happen. Um, increase of inflammation, uh, increase of collagen material, uh, vascular smooth muscle cell growth and increase in collagen, just to name a few. I also want to point out that there are different players. I mentioned earlier already the vasoactive hormones, the renin-angiotensin system being a very important one uh, leading to vasoconstriction, nitric oxide uh, dilation, sodium uh, reabsorption is important for sodium retention, which um, <clears throat> uh, um, it influences the volume in your body and can increase your blood pressure and then inflammation, oxidative stress. Here are two slides. Uh, I told you I would like to provide some methodological consideration. These are the models we use in, um, in our lab um, from mice to man. I'm also doing translation in medicine. So the angiotensin II induced hypertension model where the renin angiotensin system is activated is the most commonly used uh, hypertension mouse model. We also use the spontaneously hypertensive rat model, uh, which is a model of central hypertension at the age of eight, nine weeks, the, the uh, rats become spontaneously hypertensive. And then we study humans. Uh, I recently worked more with pa patients who have obesity, prediabetes, where also the renin angiotensin system activated. And we also perform a pressure myography, which is ex vivo testing of these small resistant vessels. Um, to study um, the functional role of EVs. For, I call it single EV analysis, we use um, targeted phenotyping with imaging flow cytometry, which has really, uh, compared to conventional flow cytometry, very uh, high sensitivity. We can go down to detect and phenotype EVs of 100 nanometers, likely even lower just by fluorescent. Um, and we can clearly separate between uh, EVs and debris and, and beads. I have uh, contrasted here, this is a conventional flow cytometry of an older instrument where uh, gray is indicating the buffer and red the EVs. This is side scatter, forward scatter, and you see they are overlapping. So it's really hard to differentiate EVs really well from the background. Uh, this plot is similar to this plot. Um, and you, we can see when we look at the low scatter area here that we can differentiate EVs clearly from debris and, and uh, from uh, beads. And then you can also see a really dynamic range. Uh, we spiked a buffy coat with some EVs 
And you see here, uh, for example, a wider range of cells with EVs, uh, which you can't do with the conventional flow. And here you see a red blood cells nicely in bright flow. You see a leukocyte uh, labeled with CD45 and next to it a leukocyte derived EV. We have here some uh, and uh, an XN5 positive particles, which might be apoptotic blabs. And when you overlay this, they are all together. So this is a technique we are using to phenotype EVs and to determine their origin, but it's targeted. So we pick the markers we want to test. So let's get, get back to hypertension. EVs, as you know, are seen as the novel um, cell to cell, organ to organ communicators in hypertension. And I told you earlier that hypertension uh, etiology is multifactorial, various organs are involved. So you can imagine that EVs can really play a good role here. Uh, but they have different roles. And um, I like to divide it often in the diagnostic role. Some people just measure their diagnostic or prognostic potential, but they have a functional role that makes them so unique and even regenerative. And um, Dr. Bird and his group and our group recently summarized um, uh, all this in a, in a review paper, which is in press and coming out next month. So if I excited you today, you might want to read that. Um, and provide much more detail. Sorry, I have to go at the bottom. So let's start with the diagnostic role of extracellular vesicle in hypertension. So um, there is a lot of evidence that patients with um, hypertension have, a high, have higher levels of circulating EVs and, and that correlates also with the severity of hypertension. And the, uh, many studies exist even early on as 2003 uh, but most of these studies actually studied only endothelial-derived uh, EVs. Makes sense, you think there is an increased pressure, so there's endothelial damage. And, um, but it was in the end unclear which, which marker really is the best ones. And also these studies differ in techniques. And especially the early, early studies have used uh, older and conventional flow cytometer and have likely measured only really large particles, more than 500 nanometers. So um, nevertheless, exciting finding that EV can correlate with um, blood pressure. So our own group was interested in how which endothelial marker is really um, elevated. And we studied this in, uh, in Android 2 induced hypertension model and um, measured the EVs after two weeks and four weeks. And we measured different um, endothelial markers which are listed here at the side. And um, interestingly, after two weeks, so compared to the control group, a couple of these annexin positive and endothelial markers uh, were elevated and uh, more, more annexin negative actually. But after four weeks, um, we didn't have significance anymore. That was quite interesting. Um, also interesting is the platelet marker didn't rise at all from two and four weeks, but the leukocyte marker really increased nicely after two weeks and then even more after four weeks and correlated with blood pressure. This is not the, uh, this is an endothelial marker. This is a leukocyte marker, not the endothelial marker correlated, uh, instead the leukocyte marker. And this is for me as a clinician more meaningful to have a biomarker which really reflects also the, the disease state. Um, Sabrina Lasavia in my lab, who is currently a postdoc here, uh, went another step. She isolated uh, EVs from the kidneys from these hypertensive mice and found that these EVs also had more uh, CD45 leukocyte-derived EVs compared to the control mice. And those levels also correlated with blood pressure. Sabrina also um, wanted them to understand, uh, okay, we have now increased leukocyte-derived EVs, um, but, but do we have any subgroup of the leukocytes, which, which in particular is, is, is different? And um, she studied um, T-cell, B-cell, monocyte, and macrophage markers. And um, in this um, study, she also um, treated the animals at the same time with antihypertensive treatment. So we see beautifully that after four weeks of blood pressure treatment, the blood pressure goes up. And then when you treat them with antihypertensive regimens, these are two different ones. Uh, one is an angiotensin receptor blocker, and this is a mix of not using an angiotensin uh, system, uh, but she could equally lower blood blood pressure very well. And she found that T cell derived EVs are really significantly increased after, um, after two, uh, four weeks of um, high blood pressure. 
not the B cells, not the, I didn't uh, show here the monocyte or macrophage derived disease. And again, we have a beautiful correlation with the blood pressure. I forgot to mention earlier that um, there is only one study in humans which has also tested the leukocytes and shown that the leukocyte derived EVs um, correlated with blood pressure better than the endothelial one. So this might represent that T cell derived or leukocyte derived EVs might be the better a uh, bio diagnostic biomarker in um, hypertension. And this, is, uh, this finding is consistent with um, the um, uh, studies of the immune system in hypertension. This is a seminal paper, elegant study where the role of uh, lymphocytes was uh, studied in uh, hypertension development. And they used uh, control mice, made them also hypertensive for angiotensin II, and then they studied REC1 mice, uh, knockout mice, which uh, don't have the lymphocyte response. And when you make them hypertensive, the blood pressure was blunted in the REC1 mice. So there was a difference. But then the group transfused back with uh, bone marrow transplantation to the REC1 mice, so no B cell, T cell, um, they, they added um, T cells, and by giving back T cells, they became hypertensive again. By giving B cells, they did not improve the blunted effect. So this is kind of an indirect way to show that T cells are important for hypertension. So this gives us hope that our data might be not too wrong. So now we can switch to the next topic about prognostic role of EVs. And um, this role has been really investigated in several cardiovascular diseases and several studies. Um, however, there's one big study in hypertension, it's actually a really big study. Um, Amabiel studied 844 individuals from the Framingham offspring cohort. Um, this is a cohort, oh, he got, tested the blood at the time when the uh, participants did not have any hypertension at entry. And he found that the endothelial marker CD144 was associated with later development of hypertension. So, so I think this is um, it's a strong study. It's actually you know, one of the larger uh, EV uh, studies. Normally, um, the human studies don't have so many samples. So I think this is um, interesting and promising. So let's go then to the next. Um, role EVs can play. Um, this uh, cartoon here uh, provides an overview of the functional role of EVs. And um, we have, the, this is from the review I mentioned earlier. And you can divide this functional role in, in, in different responses. So you can imagine as hypertension is multifactorial, the etiology is multifactorial, we can have a vascular response, uh, the immune system plays a role, the kidney, in particular the renal tubular system plays a role. Um, the regenerative um, um, function of EVs has already been tested. RNAs have been tested. And there are also medical, I call them medical and non-medical responses. Uh, people have been treated with, um, with antihypertensive drugs as we did, but also uh, used diet and exercise and, and tested the effect on the EVs and hypertension. So let's start with examples of EVs in vascular uh, response. Um, that's a little bit the, the um, <clears throat> focus of my lab is. And uh, I'm providing here a kind of busy slide, but it summarizes a lot of vasoactive factors leading to vasoconstriction or vasodilation coming from different systems. For example, we have endothelial products, but also circulating uh, uh, neurohumoral agents and among the, the vasoconstrictor well-known endothelin-1 or thromboxane A2 are very strong uh, vasoconstrictors. And then we have um, the best example for strong vasodilator, nitric, nitric oxide. And in fact, um, EVs carry um, ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, a functional 81 receptor, so part of the angiotensin receptor system, and uh, ACE produce uh, reactive oxygen um, species and are anti-vegetatory. So let me get into detail for each of these examples. And let's start with um, the work by Horn. Um, 
they showed that EV carry enos, uh, endothelial uh, nitric oxide synthase, and they studied this in a human cohort um, in patients with cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and they had uh, endothelial dysfunction measured by flow dilation. So you can measure the, the, um, the, the kind of the vascular stiffness. And they found that they had less enos in these patients compared to the healthy control and also compared to the HUVEX, the endothelial cell cultures. Um, Dylan Berger with his group studied uh, more in vitro experiments. He studied uh, EVs coming from a mouse, uh, I think a mouse aortic endothelial cells and found that uh, they produce a reactive oxygen species. And um, he also found that these, he calls them MPs at that time, uh, contain NADPH oxidase subunits, the uh, NOxes. Uh, and you see this is his MP fraction in the Western blot. This is the endothelial fraction. This is a supernatant. And he detected um, all these different NOxes and um, could even um, these EPs, EVs, oh, MPs, sorry, no, I'm confusing them, uh, could be inhibited by NOx inhibitors. He also did a functional assay, uh, what um, we uh, did with pressure myography and injected these EVs um, through uh, resistant vessels and, and found that they were anti vasodilatory I will explain that later, what that means. So we have already a lot of evidence that the EVs have a, a, a good cargo for a potential vasoactive factor. Uh, this is another elegant study where EVs carry function 81 receptor. You need to um, uh, respond to angiotensin 2. And um, this group actually uh, generated 81 receptor enriched exosomes um, released from the heart undergoing cardiac pressure. They had an animal model and they also had a stretch model, a cell culture model. But they're not that they detected 81 receptor, they transferred this to an in vivo model and could show that it had a function. So let me walk you through this. So this is um, the blood pressure goes up uh, when you give um, a wild type mouse angiotensin 2. When you have knockout mice of 81, you don't respond to angiotensin 2. But when they transferred the exosomes from a stretch model, which contains 81 receptor, they mice could become hypertensive. And the same is if they uh, also transferred the EVs from, um, from this mice model with a pressure overload. So I think this is quite elegantly, uh, elegant and shows you that they have a functional role. So let's talk now about uh, what we do in our lab. We also test the, um, the, or in particular, the vascular response in hypertension by using pressure myography. And we used uh, this time uh, the RAT model of the spontaneous hypertensive RAT, the SHR, and the WKY, the Vista Kyoto RATs as a control mice. And we used mesenteric arteries as, um, as uh, resistant vessels. Here you see a vessel um, mounted on these pipettes. And what you do is you mount these vessels and then you um, pre-constrict them with phenylephrine. And then you give atatucoline in a dose response and you, you measure how the vessels dilate. Um, it's, it's, uh, you need to be skilled and Miranda Good, who was a post postdoc at UVA and Dr. Brent Isaacson lab, has now her own lab at Tafts. She, she did this and she was very skilled and I think you need one or two years to really get uh, good at this. Um, so we studied uh, mesenteric arteries from rats and we used normotensive and hypertensive rats at 12 week, but we had another control, the WKY as well, so normotensive control rat. Uh, this describes that our mice were spontaneous hypertensive rat because their blood pressure increased spontaneously after seven, eight, nine weeks compared to the control mice. We did as well targeted phenotyping with uh, imaging flow cytometry and found also in our red model that the leukocyte derived EVs were elevated, also CD31 and correlated with blood pressure control. So, so we have, uh, this confirms uh, or is in line with our findings in the angiotensin 2 induced hypertension model, which is um, reassuring. This is just a basic characterization, getting some cryo-EMs from the WKY-EVs and SHR-EVs, 
Uh, I should mention the way we enrich for NVs. I call it an EV enriches by um, ultra centrifugation of uh, first a low spin to get rid of the cell and the debris, um, and then a 20,000 G spin to enrich for EVs. We calculate the size and also um, the numbers with uh, nan uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis, and we used a Western blot to confirm EV and non EV. Uh, markers. So let me walk you through our plots because you will see a few of them. So um, I told you this is the X. On the X, X we have um, acetyl shooting given. I told you that we give this in a dose response and in different dosages, increasing dosages. And then on the Y, X you see the percentage of relaxation. And uh, those in this column we studied um, the normal tensive uh, uh, vessels from uh, WKY, and here we studied the uh, vessels from hypertensive animals. And then we injected in these um, vessels the EVs uh, through the um, vessel, and also uh, we added it to the lumen, to the solution. And you see clearly compared to the controls, when you inject in these normal tensive vessels EVs, and measure their reaction to acetylcholine that they did not dilate as much as a control. We call this a limit of vasodilation or anti-vasodilatory. Interestingly, uh, this effect was not seen in the vessels from the hypertensive animals. And then we injected also EVs from the hypertensive animals at 12 weeks, and they behaved like um, the, the controls. So they did not uh, show this anti-vasodilation. And there was also no effect seen here. We also added uh, L-name, an L-arginine um, uh, antagonist, and uh, nitric oxide synthase um, uh, blocker, and didn't find um, a difference, um, um, didn't have a, a big change. So maybe indicating that nitric oxide might play a role in, in our model here. We translated this finding uh, to the humans. And you see here, um, uh, what we did is we took EVs from hypertensive human and injected them through mouse mesenteric vessels. And uh, the, if you took the normal tensive one, it was again uh, anti-vasodilatory. So in summary, the normal tensive EVs limit vasodilation, but this is lost in hypertensive vessels. And the SHR, they failed to reduce vasodilation, and this was not affected by L name. In the next set of experiments, we performed delipidation, uh, very crude with uh, chloroform extraction, so um, remove the lipid structure or, you know, um, kind of broke up the lipid structure, removed the lipids, and we wanted to understand if you need the, the, the full structure of the EV. And delipidation actually retained the functional effect on uh, the WKY EV. So here you see that when you use the delipidated de uh, de EVs, uh, not big changes happened. Interestingly, um, it enabled the SHRs or the hypertensive to reduce vasodilation and behave like the normal tensive one. So that was an interesting finding. So let me kind of summarize this uh, first part of the experiments. Um, so we think that the, uh, the normal tensive EVs reduce vasodilation and the independent of the EV structure as we delipidated them. Uh, on the other hand, the, the hypertensive EVs failed to, to limit the vasodilation. So now we have to try to understand that why is this? So I mentioned earlier, we have different stimuli. One is hypertension, the other one is normal tension. So what could happen is that during the hypertension, the uh, uh, adaptive processes may alter the EVs and make them more vasodilatory, maybe to counteract the increased vasoconstricted state in hypertension. And then for the normal tensive state, that's speculative, but we're trying to understand this EVs might provide a break to vasodilation in normal tension to, to prevent hypotension and, optim, uh, and uh, allow an optimal range for tissue perfusion. So in, in different circumstances, the EVs have different roles. Um, it's also interesting that these EVs from the hypertensive, uh, um, I, I said they failed to limit vasodilation, but their function was recovered by delipidation. 
So we know, um, and that's in every field, there are a lot of in vitro studies where different stimuli lead to different EVs. Um, but we are studying here EVs deriving from an in vivo system. And we we'll see that we have different uh, function here. And you can speculate and, and argue here that this vasodilatory factor might be either positioned on the outer side, which might be true for the normal tensive one, and delipidation didn't change it, or they are found within enriched EV cargo and need to be released with a, a delipidation. Uh, another point I'm uh, mentioning here is uh, the targeted phenotyping showed that, that the majority of EVs were leukocyte derived. So maybe that these changes in the cargo of EVs are also uh, in particular um, happening in these um, leukocyte derived EVs. And the last finding from our study is that uh, the hypertensive arteries were non-responsive to either the normal tensive or the hypertensive EV. So uh, they might be already, uh, including the endothelium and the smooth muscle cell, already uh, significantly altered. And one last experiment to finalize this. Uh, this is actually my favorite uh, control because we used uh, the EVs from the SHR prior to the development of hypertension. So I told you we used the Vista Kyoto rats, which are always homotensive as our control. But here we use the SHR at six weeks when they are um, not hypertensive yet. And uh, those at six weeks actually behaved like the normotensive uh, WKY. So this tells us that likely the alteration of these EV function occurs during or after the development of of hypertension in the SHR animals and is also species independent. Other studies support this, let me call it, anti-vasotillatory effect of EVs. Um, and these are interestingly done from in vitro studies. So um, EVs were taken from endothelium, uh, uh, endothelial cell cultures, they called them microparticles in 2006, and also injected them in mouse fascialis arteries, which are also these small resistant vessels. And they found also that when you uh, gave the, the EMPs from the normal tension, that they had an intervasodilatory response. Uh, Dylan Berger, uh, I mentioned his study earlier showing that uh, EVs um, produce reactive oxygen species and carry anoxus. Uh, he used uh, endothelial derived EVs from these uh, mouse aortic endothelial cells, and he also showed in mesenteric mouse arteries what we did that uh, these EVs were anti vasodilatory. We saw these black compared to the control. So these are from endothelial cell cultures. There are also two more studies um, where the EVs of different cell culture origin are also intervasodilatory. Uh, Martin uh, and his group studied uh, T cell derived EVs from tissue, <coughs> uh, T cell uh, cultures, and uh, found the same effect and postulated that uh, nitric oxide might be the player here. And uh, Fista and his group, they looked at platelet derived EV and um, had also an anti, um, uh, had a vasoconstriction and found that thromboxane A2 uh, might play a role. So um, at this point, we don't know um, if this is just an effect of one type of EVs. I doubt it. I think several uh, EV um, types are with different cargo will are involved. And I told you that a thromboxane A2 is a prominent uh, constrictor, vasoconstrictor, and now it's a vasodilator, and we are have to direct an orchestra here of all these players. So this is, uh, again, um, a summary of all these factors. Um, so they all uh, are potential um, EV cargo for me, and, and we need to investigate that more, dissect what, what's really in these EVs. Uh, we need to study subgroups. It's likely not maybe the leukocyte, T-cell, other, other important carriers, and also understand better um, the changes to the lipid bilayer or the cargo release delivery mechanisms following the development hypertension. You know, uh, where is the cargo and what happened during the um, hypertension changes? And translated to human studies, we have started that. Um, a few more slides to summarize the other function, and I give only a few examples from the literature. Uh, let's talk about uh, examples of the immune response. Um, 
I could uh, maybe convince you that T cell derived EVs are elevated in the circulation, but also in the kidneys in hypertensive animals, so they might play a role. Um, and uh, I sh there is some data that EVs from T cells can be anti vasodilatory. And there are some studies where um, mice, uh, no, hamsters, hypertensive hamsters were treated with ibisartan, uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, and um, their vessels were studied and they found less um, annexin positive EVs in the, uh, in the vessel wall indirectly um, telling us that the, uh, less infiltration of EVs and uh, that uh, there might be a mechanistic role. I mentioned also to you the medical and non-medical responses and I shared uh, um, some data from our group um, which Sabrina LaSalvia performed and um, we saw that the leukocyte ones um, <clears throat> CD45 positive were lowered in particular by a treatment with uh, hydrochlorothiazide, hydralisin, and reserpin. Um, and it correlated also well with blood pressure. Um, a lot of other drugs have been tested, calcium channel blockers, um, the androtensin receptor blocker, ACE inhibitors, direct endothelin inhibitors, uh, diuretics, um, statins, calcium neuron inhibitors, beta blockers, but also uh, non-pharmacological treatment like exercise and, and uh, f food, um, beberin. Um, but I have to say the data is not clear yet, and that's, uh, you can, <laughs> or it's, uh, I discuss this in this review. Um, but the problem is that all these studies have been done with different techniques, and it's really not so easy to compare. And some of the studies are older, so they have studied more larger EVs. But uh, definitely, we see effects of treatment on EVs in a positive way. Um, a few words about the tubular response. Um, this, I'm very excited about this field, and i like to study this more too. Um, I told you that EVs are these novel communicators, as you know, from cell to cell, organ to organ, but within the kidney, they, they can also be communicators in the, in the, um, in the nephron. So maybe um, they are part of the intranephron communication between the beginning of the tubular system and the distal part. And what um, this group did is they <clears throat> took um, EVs from the proximal tubular cells and gave them to, to collecting duct cells, more the distal tubular cells, and found a change in the ENAC activity, so uh, uh, sodium chloride. And um, that decreased. So that means that the messages from the proximal tubular system is influencing what happens at the end, where a lot of sodium uh, control happens and uh, sodium retention is important also for the hypertension pathogenesis and, and many other diseases. So, so this is, um, I think, very exciting to have intranephron communication and EVs might play a role. And this is the last um, example I'm, I'm giving. It's about um, the, one of the few studies discussing um, a therapeutic response or regenerative response of EVs. Um, it's from 2018, Otani and his colleagues. What they did is they also used the WKY and SHR red model, and they isolated also um, uh, EVs, so they, they isolated exosomes uh, with ultracentrifugation from WKY and hypertensive SHR, and then administered them intraperitoneally weekly for six weeks. And interestingly, the SHR-derived exosomes uh, led to significant high blood pressure in the normotensive WKY, and the WKY-derived exosomes lowered blood pressure in the SHR. And the SHR-derived exosomes also led to thickening and decreased abundance of collagen in the thoracic aorta, so already significant uh, vascular changes and cardiac fibrosis. So, so this is... Um, I mean, these are two functions. One is a positive and a healing, has a healing effect, and the other one is causing damage. But um, if you use a, a WKY, they lower the blood pressure in the SHR. So if I summarize um, my talk for you, um, I think... Um, I'm convinced, and I hope I could convince you, that EVs likely play a role in hypertension physiology, but also pathophysiology. So in normal tension and hypertension, they have different roles as biomarkers, and, but also bioactivators. Um, 
and they have different functional responses. I showed you the effect on the vascular system, the immune system, they have responses in the kidney, they might be used for therapy in the future, and uh, they might also help us to, to guide uh, medical and non-medical treatment. Um, a lot of studies are really um, still in vitro. I think that's true for a lot of EV studies. We need more in vivo data. Uh, we used ex vivo system with a, a pressure myography. Um, however, we used in vivo generated EVs to study them. Um, we need more rigor in studies, more transparencies. So a lot of the initial studies, they didn't do a basic characterization of EVs. So, so that's, that's missing and lacking, but I think the studies are getting um, um, more or providing more rigor overall. Now I come to my final and also very important slide. I like to thank my team members, Dr. Luca Musanter and uh, Dr. Sabrina La Salvia, and um, it, it's, um, it's a pleasure to work with them, and um, they are hard workers, and it has been really a um, wonderful time to work with them on this project and many others, and we have, so far have been lucky to get some funding. Uh, I also want to thank my boss here at UVA, Dr. Marco Cusa, and then I'm very grateful to all the uh, mentors I have and collaborators here at UVA and at other places. And I hope everybody is going to join the annual uh, ISAF meeting, which is virtual now, but going to be very exciting. Yeah, thank you very much. Open for questions. This was a wonderful presentation. It opened up a completely new world to me, not knowing uh, almost anything about TV in um, hypertension. And I, I really like your approach to look at all these different cells and how they contribute uh, in different ways to regulate important functions. We do have many questions. Uh, I, I would start with um, Janusz Rak and Alisa. Janusz uh, has a few questions. Janusz, can you, um, can you unmute yourself and ask the questions, please? Yeah, I can unmute myself. <laughs> Hi, Uta, how are you? That Hello. Great. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so basically, I think, you, I think my, there's a number of things that intrigued me, but one of the things uh, that you mentioned was that uh, the primary source of these um, vesicles that you think have the, you know, you proved that they have uh, hypertensive function is, is are the leukocytes, and I'm wondering what is the process by which leukocytes actually sense hypertension, and and what kind of vesicle stimulating pathway controls the production of these particular vesicles, you know, including their cargo, but also how, how do they actually sense the hypertension? If that's if that makes sense to yeah, I, um, there is still uh, the, the antigen, so the T cell um, are activated by antigens and our um, T cell receptor is involved. And this antigen is not 100% described. There are some candidates. So we have an antigen which um, activates the T cells and there is studies that these T cells infiltrate the kidney. So we know the T cells are in the kidney. So what do the EVs now do? So are these EVs coming, the T cell derived EVs in hypertension from the circulation or are they coming from the infiltrated cells in the kidney and then have a uh, function. Um, some of the T cell function in the kidney and hypertension are also, um, uh, people think that they cause sodium retention, which is important uh, in hypertension pathogenesis. So, so maybe EVs take part in the sodium retention, but um, we, um, that, that might be one, or they help with the antigen. I mean, we know that EVs are involved in the immune system by, you know, presenting antigens. So maybe they are part of that system. You know, you can look at different types of T cell derived EVs. So, yeah, I think this is all not known <laughs> and a lot of opportunities. Very exciting. But, but, but these are not exosomes, right? Because the way, the way you isolate them, essentially, give them a 20 k spin and basically collect everything that uh, comes down from that. That's so there, true. There's a very minimal amount of exosomes probably in, the, uh, in those 
No, we, we don't think so. It's, it's a mix. I mean, I have uh, the numbers. Um, we measured the EV size and uh, the average size was about 100, you know, and, and so there are smaller uh, EVs in there, you know. So and why would you not pull them down with standard 100k spin rather than 20? Because this was um, the beginning of our studies. We just let's see how this works. And actually, the material is very, very precious, and we didn't have a lot of material. And um, that is the next step to clean it up. Um, I likely I like to do that with humans because we have more samples. But when you have rats and in, in particular mice, you have less than a mil, eight hundred, you know. Uh, microliters that's not a lot you know and also what I think um, tells me that we are not looking as an artifact is that EVs from cell cultures had this effect as well you know so EVs from these preps yes there might be protein circulating pro proteins you know also ultra you know uh, in the prep but the cell culture also had this effect so more pure EV populations no, I, I, I no doubt about that, but I just I just think that it, you know maybe you're losing some of the activity yeah. by just not. Yeah. But anyways, I mean this is just a beginning, as you said. It's very oh, interesting. Oh yeah. That's yes. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Uta, I totally agree with Janusz because I mean, of course, you have a lot of small vesicles in a twenty k uh, g spin, but if and if you use the nanosite, you can only see the small ones. So you are only quantifying the small ones. Mm -hmm. But if you don't continue to pull down with the with the higher speed centrifugation, you're losing material. That's that's for sure. But yeah. the the data was interesting anyway. Uh, Alisa, Alisa had some questions on the delipidation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was a great talk, Uta, really fascinating. And I had a whole bunch of questions, but I, I'm really interested in the delipidation, like what it's doing to the structures of EVs and how you can be flipping the EVs in terms of their activities. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually, uh, that surprised us a lot. I mean, it's, it's a very crude method. So I'm, I'm presenting here very um, crude preparation of an EV, you know, ultra centrifugation of 20,000, and then we do delipidation. It's a chloroform ex extraction, and Luca did it. Um, so we just remove the lipids, and then you, you, you kind of take the structure away of the EVs. So you just have the pure proteins, all the stuff which is involved. Um, and, and causing um, this effect. Um, I think I, I like to understand really where uh, the information is um, shuttled between or where the or communication between the cells happens uh, through the EV. Is it the, the cargo outside the EV or is it part uh, of the, you know, it's inside or uh, does the EV um, have to be released with the mechanism, you know, the, the cargo? So, so um, how are the membranes changed during hypertension? So that is not known. And the uh, EVs from the hypertensive animals, they gained function, which is interesting, by opening up the EVs, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. I, that's, that's a new field for me. I, I'm, it opened up a lot of questions, but... Uh, it changed clearly the function, you know. Yeah, you have a big functional effect. I was wondering if you had done transmission electron microscopy just to check whether all the lipid structure was really gone or whether there was, you know, something mm -hmm. that was left. Yeah, we can do that. Yes, we have, um, we, we do uh, quite a lot of cryo EM, so uh, we can see that. That's a good suggestion, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are a couple of questions from Sandy Lau. Are you still there? Hi, yes. Um, thank you for your talk. It's really interesting. Uh, one thing I wasn't clear from, I've actually read the Good Adal paper, um, presented it to my lab group a little while ago. Um, I was just wasn't really clear whether the um, EVs uh, for example, the Worcester Kyoto EVs are uh, put back in the exact same animal that the uh, mesenteric vessels were oh. taken from, mm -hmm. or was it sort of pulled or mixed? Yeah, I mean, you can imagine when you open up 
the animal, you can take from the mesenteric bed uh, a few vessels. So um, she, she has used sometimes, um, it's not the same vessel, but she has used it from the same bed. And we have done that with several animals, yeah. Okay, um, and a second question, because I think if I remembered correctly, it was a 10 minute incubation in the uh, wire mm -hmm. myography, um, yes. both inside and outside of the vessel. Mm -hmm. um, what is, I guess my question is, what is your gut feeling? Do you think that the response will change over time? Like, especially I think, um, at the end of your talk, you're talking about Otani, the group Otani, where they actually left it for six weeks. Um, whether or not in a longer period or actually injecting the EVs into an animal will actually have like a time dependent response and acute versus more of a long term. Yeah. No, you're asking a good question. I think the effect was very fast. So you accelerate, you know, the vessel, you add the EVs. 10, 20 minutes, and then you have immediate effect. So, so the effect is there. So I think it's a vasoactive factor, uh, which is likely, um, you know, uh, causing this effect. Um, the other study I refer to was where they injected them, I think, weekly for six weeks, you know. So that was repetitive. I mean, that's uh, repetitive um, dosing, which you know, is done in, I have studied or looked at the data where they used EVs for regeneration in AKI. And sometimes it's only given once, sometimes it's given twice. Yeah, it's, it's not clear how often you have to give EVs, but I think uh, the effect is pretty quick, you know. But uh, in some, uh, some regenerative um, um, effects are uh, transmitted through um, microRNA. So that's, I think it's just a different way you know, different uh, stimulus for regeneration. I think here it's maybe more vasoactive factor we are giving, you know. Okay, thank you. Next question from Kalyani. Thanks, Dolores, and uh, yeah. uh, thanks, Ruta. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, so, uh, when we think about the uh, vascular endothelium, uh, the first thing that comes into our mind is the vascular endothelial growth factor. So uh, when you looked it into the endothelium one, so it has been found that the endothelium one expression directly correlates with the VEGF expression. And uh, rather VEGF has been found to induce the uh, ET1 production. So, uh, can you find the high VEGF expression in these angiotensin uh, extracellular vesicles? Um, I have not tested that yet. I mean, we are trying to get more answers through proteomics and um, other uh, analysis, but um, I know this has been studied in a different model of vascular damage, the thrombotic microangiopathies or mm -hmm. hemolytic uremic syndrome. But I, mm -hmm. I have to look back. I think it has been studied that, that they play a role and regulate that, Jeff. But I, I have to go back. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I think it has been studied, but not in hypertension, more in another model of vascular damage. Okay. 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 Thank you. We have another I question from Alisa. Okay. Um, hi, Uta. Yeah. I, I guess I was wondering... Um, have you looked into or, or has anyone identified any possible cell of origin for the vasodilatory EVs? It seems like the T cells were implicated in the vasoconstrictive EVs. Yeah, I, I actually think that, that this is my hypothesis that um, different um, cells uh, produce different cargo. So the T cells, I mean, there was this one um, paper showing that T cell derived were um, also um, anti-vasodilatory, likely through an NO mechanism, you know, so nitric oxide is, uh, is, uh, um, is regulation the dilatation. And they did platelet-derived, which contained thromboxane A2 with a vasoconstrictor. So T-cells, T-cell-derived, likely have a different cargo than, you know, the other cells, maybe platelet-derived. You know, there's this one study from in vitro, but I think they are, it, it's an orchestra, you know, it, it 
it's it's um, we have a little bit more of vasoconstriction and a little bit more of uh, dilation, you know. So I think there are several cell types uh, involved, and it depends also on the pathophysiology. In hypertension, the leukocyte derived might overwhelming, you know. Yeah. I wonder if you could immunoprecipitate, you know, like the CD45 positive ones and add them or the, you know, the endothelial ones and add them. Yeah. Company. Yeah, we are, we are working on that. It's uh, not easy. <laughs> it's a fascinating question. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah, we want to know, no? Single EV function. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it would be nice if we had a mouse that has EV labeled with different dyes, depending on which cells they're coming from, and yeah, then they... track their functions. But I don't know if it's possible. I know somebody was working on that, but I don't know if we've seen any data yet. But this is very fascinating, very interesting. I think we don't have, we don't have additional questions. No, I hope I didn't miss anyone. That's fine. Um, so this yeah. was uh, this was really nice. Um, 